guys, welcome to today's live with me, Phil. Uh, what are we doing today? Today I am stitching in the frame component of this top frame bag. I'm stitching it into the gussets and also the panels along the side. So this side is already done, this side here. So this is where the lock is. Uh, and on the other side, which is where the handle is, is the most awkward side. <laughs> if I knew I was going live, I would have done this side first and done the easy side on the live, but hey, that's life. So we have this area here to stitch underneath the handle. So the frame itself at the top of this bag is a steel frame and it's been wrapped around with leather and underneath is a skirt and then that skirt is what you stitch the panels and the gussets to. So on the inside you can see it's as of yet unfinished but you can see the skirt on here and that's what we're stitching onto today. Uh, okay first things first, uh, I need to keep this handle nice and high. Hi you guys, thank you for stopping by and saying hello. Ooh, that's hot. Okay, so if you do have any questions, feel free to, um, to ask me. If I miss your questions because I'm stitching, I do apologize. So just copy paste them um, to ask again if necessary. So I'm gonna bring this up here. And then put that on there like that. Okay, and that should hold it up nicely. Stitching with filou chinois, 532, let's untangle that. And three millimeter stitches, so about nine stitches per inch on this one. So I'm gonna start over here on the gusset. So I'm gonna start with a single back stitch. Make sure we equal up every bit. Distress by Leather says, hello, greetings. It was a really sunny day about 10 minutes ago and all of a sudden it's, uh, the weather has changed somewhat. It's supposed to be uh, thunderstorms today. The garden will be happy. <laughs> all right, let's get some weight in there. Give us a little bit of stability. And luckily, two of these pattern weights, well, they're not pattern weights, they're actually door stops, but I use them as pattern weights. They fit in there quite nicely, which is handy. So a few obstructions to stitch under on this one, but it shouldn't be too much trouble. So the first part is the gusset and we're stitching around a curve. Now normally what I would do is, is just stitch this with a sharp awl. My trusty old uh, Jerome David titanium awl. Titanium except for the blade obviously. Um, but on this side, because of all the obstructions, what I've done is uh, followed through all the way through with an awl, keeping everything nice and straight. And to stitch through here to make it easier, I'm actually just using a round awl, so there's no blade on it. It's just uh, opening up the holes a little bit helps me to uh, locate all the prick marks in there on the inside, especially dark leather on the inside of a bag is actually very difficult to see, so that's why I do that. Feel free to tell me where you guys are watching from. Always interested to know uh, what country you're in, where, you, where you're coming from, where you're watching from rather, and where you come from, I guess. <laughs> and also, if you're working on any projects, uh, let me know what you're working on, I'd be interested. It could be something you're working on right now as you're watching this, or it could be something uh, that you started recently. I actually just had a student send me some photos um, 
of the de Havilland travel bag that he made after watching the course, the video course that I produced. And he's made it in camo leather. <laughs> it's really cool looking. I'll have to try and share that on stories. But that was a cool project. Ah. Martin Carswell says, I'm about to go to bed. It's midnight here. <laughs> yes. Australia. Are you working on a wallet? What kind of wallet are you working on? Bifold or billfold? Long wallet? What kind of... Uh, what kind of wallet is it? Be interested to know. All right, so... Okay, carefully turning things here. Our bifold wallet. Cool. Okay, so this part is stitching in the front part of the panel onto the gusset. So we're going to be binding this over. A little bit of tension on here, so I'm going to double cast this thread just to hold a little bit better. So can I gather the thread, move it in manually, squeeze, and then just hold it for a little bit. I'm working on a modern bag, but inspired by the Viking era. That's very interesting. So is it, is it tooled with some uh, Viking runes or something similar, or is it just a style perhaps? Finally, do a live video when it's not 2 a.m. here. Yeah, usually I do them towards the end of the day. Another double cast. I'm working on a bag. I love the bag that you're stitching. Thank you very much. Three or 2.75. I'm not sure how strong linen again is against Vinamo. Uh, I don't have, I've only tried a sample of Vinamo. I haven't really put it on any, any bags or anything that's going to be uh, under high stress. If you're worried, just go a little bit, go up a size if you're using linen, if that's something that concerns you. I think it's uh, a lot of people, there's a big debate over which is stronger linen thread or polyester thread. Depends on the linen, depends on the polyester, but um, usually it's polyester is a little stronger. You don't get the same look, it's not as traditional, and if those things matter to you, then linen thread is, is the way to go. I, uh, I mix and match, some projects will be linen, some projects will be polyester. Usually I prefer linen, just prefer using it. But much comes down to the design and construction. I mean, if you're using, for example, a, a raised area on a wallet, okay, so I don't know if you can see that here. You can see there's a raised area here, right next to the edge, and you can see all the linen stitches in there. Now, it's not really going to wear out because if I get a ruler or just block of wood, if I press down, it contacts the raised portion or the edge about 1.5 millimeters before it even gets to the thread. So in this case, it really doesn't make much difference what I stitch it in with as long as it's long lasting um, because it's not, it's not going to wear out you'd have to wear out the bag before you got to the thread. Now, some parts are gonna get a lot of handling. If they're gonna be outdoors a lot, it's gonna be exposed to water, things like that. Then, yeah, polyester. I'm looking from United States, Atlanta. That's pretty cool. 
Do I prefer hand stitching or machine stitching? I, I would say hand stitching. Uh, no runes for your Viking bag. Uh, uh, I want to fight with metal engraving too. <laughs> Uh, nice watch, is that a Citizen Pro Master? Yes, yes, a Citizen Pro Master. I recently took up uh, scuba diving, so I thought I'd get myself a watch for it. Sorry, just scrolling down, guys, forgive me. Hello, I'm from Indonesia, nice watch. I get a lot of compliments on like literally the cheapest watch I own. <laughs> Funny. From Colombia, and the next person's from Argentina. Nice. Yeah, I, I bought this watch as kind of like a holiday watch, or when I go diving as a backup to my dive computer. Mostly because I wanted it, not really for practical reasons. So stitching underneath the uh, the handle attachments here, the steel handle attachments. This is why I pre-pricked everything. <laughs> Otherwise I'd be concentrating so hard, I wouldn't be able to talk to you guys. Hand stitching is the way to go. Yeah, I agree. I mean, it depends what kind of business model you have, whether you're making bespoke items or whether you want to make uh, high volume items. Uh, there's pros and cons to both. There's no right or wrong. It's just uh, preference really. What you're more comfortable with. I enjoy hand stitching is one of the things that keeps me involved in leather craft is there's certain things that I really enjoy doing. Uh, I enjoy skiving. I enjoy hand stitching. I guess I like the challenge of it. It's something that appeals to me. Um, machine stitching, uh, certain parts, it really doesn't matter whether you're using machine or hand stitching, especially if you're using linings made of material, then yeah, it definitely makes sense for machine stitching. All right, got some comments here. I uh, use it on the prototype I'm making, I really liked it. The thread size and iron size also depend on how thick the leather is. I would assume, I would assume so. Wish I had a chart to make it easier to decide. Uh, I, I don't have it with me, but I do have a chart that I put into the techniques of hand stitching, which is actually the first course I ever created. as a kind of a rough guide to help you choose uh, thread thickness and iron size, etc. But yes, uh, thicker leather, larger iron and thicker thread is usually uh, the way to go if you're making something like a wallet compared to I don't know, a trunk handle um, you want the uh, you want a thicker thread for items that I mean if it's going to be thick leather it's probably something that's going to come under heavy use right um, like an attache case a large doctor's bag like a full-size version of what this actually is uh, then you're going to want thicker thread and it's going to look a bit funny if you use a small iron. So everything proportion. But I will say now a lot of it comes down to personal preference. And you can also make a bit of a, a statement piece out of uh, you know, a small item with thick chunky thread or a larger item with thinner thread if done intelligently. Um, and it's, it's made to kind of stand out a little bit, then if that's something you want to bring into your design, then you can absolutely kind of break the rules, not that there really is any. All right. Uh, how many years have you invested into leather work? I like the way you use the word invest. Uh, give me about 12 or 13, I think. 12 or 13, yeah, something or something like that. Uh, 
sorry, just scrolling up. Uh, personally, I use a machine only to sew fabric linings. I love hand stitching. Yeah, I agree. That would be a good example of where you'd really want to use it. Hi from Singapore. Oops, I bought up the, uh, the keyboard there. Uh, what other household items do you use in your workshop? Household items? You mean like a floor cleaner, room spray? <laughs> Give me a, a little bit of references to um, context. Apologies if I was just talking about something to do with that. I have the memory of a fish sometimes, especially if I'm actually doing something. Did you do your 10,000 hours already? Uh, I, I haven't worked it out. If you were to do it full time for seven years, I think it's uh, give you 10,000 hours, but I mean. There is much, uh, I've, I've read that book. I think it's Outliers. I can't remember the name of the author. Uh, not Simon Sinek. Um, I forget now. Yeah, it was a good book. I think it's a very rough idea for mastery, but it depends what you've done with those 10,000 hours. Were you learning or were you doing exactly the same thing over and over and over again? Like you can have a diesel mechanic get 10,000 hours on one particular type of diesel engine. He's not gonna know what to do with a Formula One car. So, it depends what kind of mastery, mastery over many different types of leather goods or over one specific type of leather goods. There's, there's so many variables involved. Natural talent, but having a mind that remains open to learning or the beginner's mind as it's often referred to. If you have a closed mind and you have 10,000 hours, you've just done it many, many times the same way. Malcolm, Malcolm Gladwell. Yeah, that's the guy. The big hair guy. <laughs> I think he actually, uh, he had a masterclass on masterclass. I don't know if anyone knows that there's a website called masterclass.com. Um, I actually bought their, uh, Bought their subscription, was well, not really a subscription. I bought their for their courses. And Malcolm Gladwell had a masterclass on there. That was pretty good actually. But his books are better. I actually prefer Mastery by Robert Greene. Now there's a book. If you want to learn how to get good at something, the kind of mindset it takes to become world class at something then mastery by uh, robert green great book trying to see underneath that little handle attachment there looks good phil says uh able slab hopefully i can see that because it's written in white over the reflection of the doorknob. <laughs> How do you prevent leather from being sticky? Is leather sticky? Or are you saying like grippy, like kind of lamb skin, like it grips the fingers? If that's the case, then uh, choose a different leather. If you're buying leather and it's becoming sticky, then there's, there's a problem uh, that needs uh, not so much a remedy, but prevention, which is don't buy that kind of leather. Scrolling one more time there. Like the door stops you use as weights. Yeah, these, these are actually just door stops. Uh, one or two kilos each, I don't know what they are. But they're rubber sided and they're also rubber on the base, obviously to stop doors if you want to keep them open. 
uh, and they're small and compact. The reason I like them is because the rubber makes them grip like they're four times the weight. So if you have a solid piece of metal, it doesn't grip like rubber, so you can have a lot less weight and a more, more of these little things. And it holds things like rulers and patterns and things like that. If you have half on the desk and half on your ruler, uh, it holds things really nice and steady, whereas a, a metal one, got a couple of metal, seven kilo metal ones there, they don't even hold it the same. Sorry, just scrolling up, guys. Don't want to miss all your comments here. I've just started Leathercraft and I'm loving it. Any tips or suggestions for very, very, very new beginners? Yeah, be a sponge. Um, soak up as much information as you can and practice as much as you can. It really comes down to how many hours you can really devote to to starting with the craft. Get as much leather as possible, and you're gonna make mistakes constantly. Your work is not gonna be that good, and it's, accept it as part of the process. But just making a start is the, uh, the biggest step of all. So just be open to practicing a lot, any spare time you get. And get different types of leather. Don't just buy one piece of leather and then try all your techniques on that. Um, I get a lot of people who buy like thin, soft, chrome tan leather and they try and stitch it and then they send me pictures going, oh, it's not working, I can't stitch it properly and all the stitches are straight, what pricking iron should I get instead? It's nothing to do with that, it's all to do with the fact that, you know, they're stitching something very soft and very thin and it's not able to hold the stitches well uh, or they're pulling way too tight. And so try and get you know, some samples, if you can get some samples, even if it's off eBay or something, just get various different kinds of leather, soft leathers, firm leathers, thick leathers, thin leathers, veg tan leathers, chrome tan leathers, re-tanned leathers. Just try and kind of get familiar with them all and how it makes your stitching or your skiving or your products that you're making um, very, very different. Uh, never heard of Mastery by Robert Green. Got to check it out. To master anything, I've learned that you've got to live it, breathe it, etc., all the time. Make it your part of your being. Yeah, I mean, I, I, in my in my nature, I mean, you know, just ask my family. If I, if I start liking something, I become completely consumed by it, or not at all. That's that's kind of my the way my brain works. If I latch onto something, it's just a hundred percent into it, which is not always a good thing. Um, but for things like leather craft, as it's part of my business, then it's definitely a good thing. I, I don't tend to do things by halves generally. You know, I, I tend to go completely all in. And there are pros and cons to that, of course, because if I go all in on something that's uh, completely, you know, doesn't really make a difference in my life, it's just, I don't know, like watches or something, you know, it's something easy to get obsessed in, but it doesn't really improve your life that much. Then I have to kind of uh, try and curb it a little bit. I think Leathercraft is the only one that has never kind of waned. Something that I stay interested in all the time, probably because I'm, I'm still always doing different things. I wouldn't ever want to make the same thing over and over and over again constantly. Um, I'd need more stimulation than that, so. So double wrapping that. Uh, and then just holding that. Door stops is genius, yeah. Saw them in the supermarket once, I thought, rubber based, I like that. After today, all door stops will be sold out, yeah. Just driving to the Home Depot. <laughs> I'd probably get them online, to be honest with you. Uh, eBay and Amazon, um, places like that, I will, will, will stock them usually. Uh, I think in my pattern making course and the course supply list that comes with the video, um, 
I, I, it's an eBay account that I link that, that sells them. Obviously, you don't want to buy it internationally because shipping on something that's heavy is not ideal. Uh, just having internet problems, dropping in and out. Uh, is that me, guys, or, or is, is that you? If there's any issues, let me know. So just stitching around this curve, almost at the end here now. Um, gambler jeans like mine. <laughs> you could go broke buying tools though, yeah. Luckily, I've never really become over obsessed with tools. It's one of those things I'm careful with um, because I, I do have a, a system of buying tools. I have to really need it before purchasing. It's something that I, I can't continue efficiently without uh, because it's one of those things that if you're not careful, you just start buying everything and then you spend a lot of time playing with new tools as well. I mean, if you're a hobbyist, that's absolutely fine, but... Uh, Yeah, tool buying can be a bit consuming. Especially if you're new, because a lot of the tools that you'll buy uh, might not be serving you very well. That's actually why I created the uh, Tool Buyer's Guide. And if anybody's interested in the Tool Buyer's Guide, if you go to leathercraftmasterclass.com, there's also a link in my bio, uh, you'll see a pop-up that will come up and you can get the free guide, which shows you what you need versus what you don't, depending on what stage you're at. <laughs> what actually makes leather goods look luxury slash expensive? My work is okay, but somehow looks cheap. It's a, very, it's a very hard one to describe because realistically, luxury is, is in the eye of the beholder. It's open to interpretation, it's subjective. But there are a few markers, and I wrote a blog about this. I think it's the seven signs of luxury. So if you go onto my website, give me plugging away. Uh, go to my website, leathercraftmasterclass.com, or hit the link in bio and select blog, which is in the menu on the bio. Um, the seven signs of luxury. It's just easier if you went there because I wrote a whole entire article on the exact question you just asked me. Um, but it is very subjective, but I, I do give some pointers as to what makes something look luxurious. Uh, it's very much design-based, materials-based, craftsmanship-based. Okay, snippy snip time, where are we? Very nice, I congratulate you. Thank you very much, Mancolo. Uh, sorry, just scrolling up. Uh, I know what you mean, I'll have Palosanto tools and KS Blade, yeah. Your bank manager must love you. <laughs> And they're not too expensive. I use some cork pan bases as a backer when I need to manually pierce the leather with my awl, yeah. I use uh, Woodford Reserve corks. Posh bastard. <laughs> I don't actually like Woodford Reserve. Uh, much prefer Maker's Mark. Greetings from Bogota, Colombia. Very nice, thank you. How are you? I'm very well, thank you for asking. Good tools are good, but solid technique and materials makes great work, thoughts. Yeah, I mean, if you were, if you were to give someone with a few months worth of uh, 
experience the finest tools as decided by a panel of experts and asked them to produce some kind of work. And then you gave a world-class expert uh, the cheapest AliExpress toolkit that you could find and then waited two months for it to arrive. Um, you would see that not much improvement would be had with the right tools with the beginner and there wouldn't be much loss of quality for the person with rubbish tools. And that definitely comes down to experience um, because there's, there's three things that I'd say is like in, in the, the triangle of mastery in leather craft, you've got tools, you've got leather, and then you've got knowledge, which is technique, okay? So good tools is helpful, but that's about it, okay? It makes life easier, more efficient. Having the right tools is definitely helpful. Undeniably, it's helpful. Um, having good quality leather, also very, very important. Poor quality leather, it's very difficult to do great work with poor quality leather, so that's also very important. But what is essential is the top, which is the knowledge, because that makes, that amplifies the effects of good tools, that amplifies the effects of good quality leather, is having that knowledge, uh, which is why I teach what I teach, because it's the most important aspect. Uh, so in answer to your question, yes, uh, technique trumps everything really. Uh, scrolling up, can I ask you questions? Yes, you can, and you started with one. <laughs> Thank you, I'll check that out as soon as possible. Hello from Chile, hello. Man, there's a lot of comments to get through. Uh, for the new beginner, take proper lessons like Phil's. I self-taught, but I want to take, I want to take his lessons now. A good teacher can cut short a lot of learning and help you avoid bad habits and techniques. Absolutely, and thank you very much for saying that. Uh, yes, it's definitely, uh, you know, taking courses is going to be a huge shortcut. So you can reduce the amount of time that you're spending trying to find things out, but also, you're gonna discover things that you weren't looking for in the first place, so you wouldn't have ever found them. Um, answers to questions that you don't even have yet. Uh, and it just speeds up the process of you becoming from a beginner to becoming truly great at something. If you have a passion for it and you put enough time into it, of course, you still have to actually use the knowledge and use the skills in practice to make sure that you have that mind-muscle con uh, connection or proprioception, as they call it. Um, but yeah, it just definitely cuts things a lot short, but it also broadens your horizons as to what is possible. Um, because if you're not searching for a technique to learn how to do it because you don't know it exists, then you're seriously going to be behind. Um, but yes, right. Let's take a look at this bag. I'm not going to close it yet. It's never been closed. Uh, the reason is I'm going to do it on camera for the course because there's a little bit of technique involved in closing one of these for the first time. The leather needs to be folded into the right position in order to take a set. Okay, a set is basically where uh, leather has been in a certain position for a length of time. Uh, much like using heat or using water, if you want to mold something, uh, time is one of the factors that causes leather to change shape. So heat, time, and also uh, moisture. So those are the, the main things that cause on it. So this requires being set in a right position for a certain length of time. Can speed it up with heat and moisture, actually. Hello for a run, you're on point, thank you very much. You are a former Louis Vuitton worker. New, 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 new. That'd be a nice experience though. Uh, Japanese pricking irons to sign where the holes will be and after I use a diamond awl. The first thing I saw is important to make all the holes in the same way, in the direction. Okay. Yeah, I mean, it, that, that's absolutely possible. A lot of people don't, um, don't know that. It's actually a good little hack. You could, as long as you've got something to mark where your stitches are, 
and you're proficient with an awl, as in you don't change the direction you're pushing it in all the time and it stays at the same angle, the blade goes in at the same angle, you can absolutely use uh, uh, diamond stitching chisels just to delicately mark the leather to then follow with an awl and you will get the angles on your stitch. It's just going to be a little bit easier and arguably perhaps a little bit finer if you use a pricking iron that actually has the slanted teeth or the slanted prongs in there. Um, because it guides the awl perfectly rather than having to really focus on making sure the awl goes in not too high or too low. Um, uh, the old fold design says, uh, I am a... <laughs> it's like three comments have just jumped in, or one comment. I'm a dilettante, and over the years, I have realized it with everything I ever wanted to be good at. A great teacher is who you want to latch on and be a sponge. Yes, ideally. The ideal situation is a mentorship. Yeah, definitely. Besides needing a tool in order to purchase it, what's your research process to determine which of all the options to get price, material, manufacture? Um, it really depends what stage you're at. I'm at the stage now where most of the time, or uh, a high hit rate, I can kind of look at a tool and know whether it's going to be useful to me or not, just by kind of looking at it, uh, even if it's online, and, and just looking at the materials that it's made for, what company's making it, for example. But I can kind of look at it and go, yeah, I, I know that's going to be ideal. Like something like this, for example, is just a really odd looking knife. I kind of looked at that and thought, yeah, I can see that this flat plane here is going to be very easy to hold upright in my hand, which is going to give more accurate cuts. I can see that this part is flared out and it goes nicely over the thumb there. And the blade is at the top, which means it's going to swivel quite nicely. So I can kind of look at it and see that. But in the beginning, you really want to rely on reviews. You want to see what people that you look up to are using. Obviously use caution with that because like including myself, I get sent tools for free. Um, so, you know, you have to kind of be careful if you're looking to someone and buying everything that, they, that they've got. You have to know that a lot of it is going to be sent to them for free. But if you can find out what they've actually chosen themselves or what's used in industry, uh, going back to this knife, this is a Trinsetto knife, this is Italian made, and a lot of the Italian shoemakers and bag makers use it. You can see it a lot in their videos. Um, so you can see that it's, it's used in the industry itself, not just by an influencer, not just by people you see online. Because a lot of people will buy things because everyone else is buying them. And the, those people that bought them bought, bought it because everyone else was buying it. You know, and it kind of snowballs and then Everyone thinks it's the best because everyone's buying it. It's not always the case. So, um, you know, reviews is the tool used in industry um, <clears throat> and, and certain things like that. So I think those, those are the main things I would say. Sorry for my English. That's absolutely fine. That's absolutely fine. Okay, so yeah, so I've just finished stitching in this part of the bag. So I'll be pressing in those stitches to make them look a little bit nicer, but so far, this is where we're at, and these will take a different shape once they've had that set produced into them. The bag feet still need to go on, and also the internal component. And we have our bag pocket there, okay? So this course, believe it or not, is gonna be available tomorrow. Tomorrow or the day after. It's coming down to the wire on this one. This is a big course to do in one video. <laughs> so I'm trying to get kind of like more compressed into these videos at the moment. So uh, if it's a smaller project, it's uh, I usually have a few days free so I can take my time with the editing. This one is, uh, there's a lot of information going into this one. So it will be available, hopefully, tomorrow evening. What a nice bag. Thank you very much. Yeah, I mean, it still has uh, a strap or flap that goes over the top into the lock. So that's still to come. Uh, it still has a clochette or a key holder that's going to have for the lock, which is on the front here. So I'll just show you. And also a bag strap, something a lot of people have asked about um, 
in the terrain course, okay, is, is adaptable for a strap, but it's the design of the bag is to be strapless, like an evening bag. Uh, but this one will be coming with a strap and you can see the attachments here, which are being protected at the moment. That's where you'll be attaching the stainless steel attachments. Can't wait to watch the video. I can't wait to hear your thoughts, guys. I'm really excited about this one because it's been a really, really fun project to actually film and produce. Um, there's so many like new techniques in this bag which have never been put out there before, uh, let alone on the masterclass. So there's so many new things that's gonna be going on in this. I'm really excited to uh, hear your thoughts. Don't forget guys, if you're brand new to the Leathercraft Masterclass, head to leathercraftmasterclass.com, download your free tool guide and also your leather buyer's guide. Uh, and I'll send it right to your inbox absolutely free. But thank you for watching. And if you're watching this on YouTube, because I'm gonna try and upload it to YouTube as well, uh, don't forget to give me a like if you enjoyed or you gained some kind of value from this video. But thank you very much and I will see you next time. Take care guys.